I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Let's make that confession and ask God's blessing on our worship in a moment of silent prayer. Our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Beloved congregation in our Lord Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father, from Jesus Christ our Lord, and through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue worshiping God by singing 269, 269. With thankfulness enter His gates, this is the third stanza. His praise in His temple proclaim, your voices in thanksgiving raise, and bless ye His glorious name. All four stanzas, 269.
let's make confession of our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing number 333. 333. Not as a response to the law that was read. We do that in the morning service. But as a confession of our love for God's law. For God's law. While my heart thy word obeys, I'm kept from evil ways. From thy law, with thee to guide, I have never turned aside. We express our love for God's law. When we sing this, keep in mind that the law of God in the Old Testament is not simply the Ten Commandments, but the whole of what was written. Probably at this time, the first five books of the Bible. We love God. God's law, the four stanzas, 333. come before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are the sheep of thy pasture and the people of thy hand. Thou leadest thy people like a flock by the hand of our Lord Jesus Christ, providing us what we need for body and soul, guarding us 
watching over us, our every need. Thou dost, as a good shepherd, understand our needs far, far better than we do. Sometimes, as Thou dost lead us, the way is in the sea. Sometimes the way is in the wilderness. Sometimes the way is by the green pastures and beside the still waters. But always, in wisdom, Thou dost lead and guide us, Thy people. Thou dost lead us by Thy Word. And we come before Thee this evening with Thy Word before us, the Word that we confess, the Word that we sing, the Word that more and more we desire to pray in the language of, the Word that's preached to feed our souls. By that Word, guide our feet. By that Word, may there be a bright light that shines before us to direct us in our way. By Thy Word, declare to us the forgiveness of sins that we need first of all. Declare to us how much Thou dost love us and testify that to us and to our children so that we may live in that consciousness and the consciousness that that love for us is not dependent upon our worth works or actions, but dependent alone on the worth and the works of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank Thee for Him, the Good Shepherd of the sheep, in whose name we pray. We thank Thee for Him and the suffering that He endured for our sake, so that all of our suffering would not be experienced by us as Thy judgment, but as chastisement, as correction, but always sent in love. Lord God, show us that though the way sometimes is difficult, the destination that Thou hast in store for us is glorious. Teach us to weigh the burdens that we bear today over against the weight of the glory that is in store for us. And to consider the weight of the burdens as nothing. Therefore, because we compare what we hope for and teach us to measure the length of the suffering that we experience now with the eternity of glory in Thy presence in heaven, where all our tears will be wiped away, where every pain is removed and every sorrow obliterated. And we live in Thy presence, hearing of Thy love for us and Thy wisdom in time and history to the greatest delight of our souls. And then may we reckon the length of our sufferings here as short, as brief. But show us, Father, the glory that's held before us, uh, the glory that's in store for us. May we live in that hope. And as the Lord Jesus, for the hope that was set before Him, endured the cross and despised the shame, so may we endure and bear up and be faithful all the way to the end as we understand what Thou hast in store for us in glory. We thank Thee for that prospect. We also pray that we may have hope for Thy goodness to us in the near future, tomorrow and in the coming weeks. Teach us not to fear. Put in our hearts a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for the things of the kingdom, that we may not lay up our treasures here upon earth, that we may understand that a man's life does not consist in the things that he possesses, the abundance of things that he owns, 
and work in us to pray that Thou wilt be pleased not to give us riches nor poverty to understand the real spiritual temptation of riches. If Thou art pleased to grant us an abundance, then work in us to be liberal in our giving, to be wise in our spending, to be useful to the poor and the causes of the kingdom, the cause of missions, the cause of the Christian education of our children. Lord God, bless those efforts that we engage in. Bless our churches that we may be faithful and that together we may all set our hearts upon heaven, that together we may be unified in the value of the confession of the Lord Jesus Christ, a testimony that we love Him and love His Word, and a walk, a united walk in obedience to His commandments. Bless the cause of missions that we engage in, our missionaries in this land and other lands. May they not be weary in well-doing. May they bear up also under the burdens that they have and the unique circumstances they live in make their labors fruitful. And bless Thy saints in other lands too, especially in the Philippines. We thank Thee for the brother and his wife and son who may labor among us for these months now. Bless the internship. Make it profitable for him, for the ministry in the Philippines, and for us as a church and as churches. Bless the seminary as it begins its labors tomorrow. Raise up many men for the work of the ministry, the pastoral ministry, the labor on the mission field. Raise up faithful men, able men, men who love Thee and love Thy people and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our schools. First of all, bless our homes, our families, our marriages. Bless the single members in the congregation. Bless the widows and the widowers. Remember each one, O oh God, young and old. And then as we labor together, bless our schools. And as they begin in the coming week or weeks, may they prosper. May the teachers stand faithfully in the stead of us who are parents and teach spiritual things. All of those necessary subjects always in the light of Thy Word. And may our teachers be godly examples to our children. And may the children learn then to live together in obedience, in submission, in kindness, in humility. Father, remember each one of Thy people gathered here tonight. Remember those that can't be here tonight. We love to worship together. We love the assembling of ourselves together. Some are not able to come because of illness or caring for those who are young or sick. Re restore them according to Thy will, and those who are absent because they are willfully absent and sinfully absent, convict and return them if it be Thy will, O God. Teach us to pray for them, to love them, to bring Thy Word to them, to stand with open arms ready to receive them, and bless those who are here tonight, here and yet disobedient, stubborn, unbelieving, may Thy Word be a power to save them. Thy Word as it's preached and Thy Word as it's sung. May the Lord Jesus Christ speak a powerful, creative, correcting Word for the salvation of all Thy people. 
So bless thy servants as they bring thy word tonight. In some lands the sun has set, the night has ended, thy people sleep. Bless them in the close of this Sabbath. Remember others who yet in the middle of this day delight in the Sabbath and enjoy the rest for their souls. But bless thy word as that word goes forth. Prepare the two graduates and candidates and now pastors elect for their examinations and provide, if it be thy will, for Brother Matani a place. Direct each call as the call is extended in each of those three churches today. Direct a call according to thy will. And then grant that brother patience and confidence in thee that thy will shall be done. Forgive the sins that we've committed. There are many. Forgive us in the blood of thy Son. Forgive us in the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and whose name is preached. Bless our pastor as he preaches that name, and our elders as they direct us into his name in obedience to him, and our deacons as they minister his mercies, the mercies of our Lord Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Deacons receive your offerings tonight first for the Emeritus Fund, that is the, the fund that supports our retired pastors, and then secondly for Perspectives in Covenant Education, a magazine we really all ought to subscribe to that deals with teaching and our schools. Let's worship God in the giving of our gifts, first for the Emeritus Fund, and then for Perspectives in Covenant Education. Let's sing number 217, 217. O Lord, the, our Savior, help and glorify thy name. Deliver us from all our sins and take away our shame. Forgiving mercy be sought. This is Psalm 79. Let's sing all four stanzas of 217. God we read this evening is the last part of Leviticus 9 and all of Leviticus 10.
The last part of Leviticus 9, beginning at verse 22, and reading through verse 20 of chapter 10. Leviticus, as I'll point out, is mostly law, but includes two brief incidences of history. This is one of them. The context of this history is that the law has been given, the tabernacle has been erected, the priests have been given their instruction as to how they must dress and how they must make their offerings, and the offerings have begun. The burnt offering has been made, and now in verse 22 of chapter 9 we read, And Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people, and blessed them, and came down from offering of the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation, and came out, and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, that is, a metal container on the end of a rod, a censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Uzziel, the, cousin, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near. Carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, Bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation. Lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. And Moses spake unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar, his sons that were left, Take the meat offering that remaineth of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. And ye shall eat it in the holy place, because it is thy due, and thy son's due, of the sacrifices of the Lord made by fire, for so am I commanded. And the wave breast and the heave shoulder shall ye eat in a clean place, thou and thy sons and thy daughters with thee. For they be thy due, and thy sons' due, which are given out of the sacrifices of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The heave shoulder and the wave breast shall they bring with the offerings made by fire of the fat to wave it for a wave offering before the Lord. And it shall be thine and thy sons with thee by a statute forever, as the Lord commanded. And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. And he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place, 
seeing it is most holy, and God hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place, as I commanded. And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burned offering before the Lord. And such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? And when Moses heard that, he was content. That far we read the Holy Scripture tonight. The text is the first three verses of chapter 10. Let's reread those together. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. The sermon on a familiar text like this with such a strange title or theme needs to defend its title or theme, at least explain the title. You've seen in the bulletin that the theme of the sermon is, For Jesus' sake, Amen. Do you recognize that, children? The title of my theme this evening is, The Way You End Your Prayers. You always end your prayer by saying, For Jesus' sake, Amen. And that's the title of the sermon tonight. Why, you say, Is that your title? The sermon will have to explain that, but you will not understand the explanation unless you understand that this text comes in the book that it comes in. The text is in Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Exodus is the book in the first five books of the Bible that describes the establishment of God's covenant with Israel as a nation. God says in the book of Exodus, like He says elsewhere, but especially there, I'm your God, and you are my people. I will live with you, and you will live with me. That's the book of Exodus. He brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, established them as a people in that book, instructed them in that book, build the tabernacle, because in the tabernacle I'm going to live with you and express my love for you, but I am your God, you are my people. That's the book of Exodus. Spoken to Israel through Moses from Mount Sinai. The book of Leviticus now takes the truth of God's covenant a step further and gives instructions especially with regard to how the people of God may go into that tabernacle. How they have access into that tent of God's dwelling place. How may they go into the presence of God Himself and once they are there, how must they live with God in the covenant? That's especially the book of Leviticus. You can understand then that the book of Leviticus was a very important book for the people of God. In fact, we're told by some old Jewish writings that the book of Leviticus was one of the first books that the children memorized in their youth. It was the book of Leviticus, the law of God that they loved, that taught them how they may come into the presence of God, and once they are there, how they must live with God. It was the book of Leviticus that the parents taught their children when they rose up and when they sat down, when they walked by the way and when they lay down again at night. And it was the book of Leviticus and the law of God revealed there that David sang about in the Psalms that we sang. Oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation day and night. 
He wasn't speaking there only of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt and thou shalt not, beautiful as those commandments are. He was speaking of the whole of the revelation of the will of God in Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but especially those two books that have the law of God in them. In this book of Leviticus, the priests are emphasized because the priests were the office bearers that showed the people how they may have access to God. What's the way into that tabernacle? What right do we have to fellowship with God there? That was the work of the priests. And then along with emphasis on the priest is the emphasis on the word holiness. Over and over in the book of Leviticus, that word is used at least a hundred times in one form or another. In the mitre that the high priest wore, that elaborate hat that God instructed him to wear, was written on a plate of gold, Holiness unto the Lord. That was the work of the priest to teach the people of God about holiness. Because God said to the people, You be holy because I am holy. And without holiness, the Apostle says in the New Testament, reflecting on the book of Leviticus, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And there's the point. There's the key to the text. How may we come into the presence of God Himself? Answer, only when you are holy with the holiness that God provides for you. You have none of your own. God must give it to you. And without that holiness, you may not come into the presence of God. Probably some of you older children now have a clue as to why the theme of the sermon this evening is, For Jesus' sake, Amen. But if you don't understand that, then keep listening. I'll explain it as I preach this text under that theme. For Jesus' sake, Amen. The sin of Nadab and Abihu. I want to explain first the sin and its judgment. In the second place, the explanation. And there's the important part of the sermon. And third, the response. And that's the very last part of verse 3. The response to the judgments of God upon this sin of Nadab and Abihu. The sin and the judgment, the explanation, and then the response. Nadab and Abihu who committed this sin were the oldest two of Aaron's four sons. Aaron, you remember, is the older brother of Moses who led Israel out of the land of Egypt. Aaron had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. You read about Eleazar and Ithamar, the two sons that were left in the rest of chapter 10. Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar. By appointment of God, they were the priests. The others in the tribe of Levi were the assistants to the priests, but Aaron and his sons were the God-appointed priests. By the ordination of God, and that's recorded in the previous chapters, they became priests. Just as God willing, seminarian and candidate Heisinger and, Mata and uh, Decker, and God willing, soon Matani, will be officially placed into the office of the ministry. These men were placed officially into the office of the priesthood. They were given the garments to wear. They were given that headpiece to put on. They were instructed as to all of the proper activities that they would engage in. And they were anointed with the oil of anointing. In that ceremony is that somewhat strange procedure where the blood of the sacrifice was applied to the right earlobe and the right thumb and the right great toe on the foot of each of these priests, all of them having significance. Study the book of Leviticus to understand that. 
These men were the official priests in the nation of Israel. They were in a position of leadership. It's important to remember for the end of the sermon, God willing, tonight. These young men with their father and their uncle Moses were given the privileged honor of ascending Mount Sinai to sit down and meet with God, see God, and even eat with God. Read Exodus chapter 24. These men were God's priests. The sin that they committed, therefore, we'll come to that again, was not that they were unauthorized persons. They were authorized to offer the sacrifices and to offer the incense. The work of these priests was to teach the people how they could have access to God. The work of these priests was primarily to offer the sacrifice, the burnt sacrifice, outside of the tabernacle to show the people of God that that's the way by that sacrifice, and only by that sacrifice could they enter into fellowship with God. The shedding of the blood of an innocent substitute. And without the shedding of that blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins, there could be no holiness, and there could be no fellowship with God. They offered the sacrifices the sacrifices that were burned with fire. It's interesting to see that the end of chapter 9, that a fire came out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And that was a sign and a type for the people of God then, that unless God in His fiery wrath burned this innocent sacrifice, they could not come into the tabernacle. Then the priests were to take coals of fire from that sacrifice in their censers, place those coals on the altar of incense, and put incense on those coals, which then began burning and smoking in an aromatic smell to God. And that incense and the smoke of the incense represented, you understand from the book of Revelation, the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the people of God are sweet-smelling savors to God. God delights to hear our prayers. He smells them with joy. He's pleased by them as those prayers ascend in obedience to God's commandments. Now the key here is the burning of that incense by the fire. That incense was burned. Fire is necessary. And it's important to see that because the key element of their sin was that they offered strange fire. Foreign or unauthorized fire. Fire that was supposed to come from that altar of burnt offering now came from elsewhere. So before I explain the sin of these priests, understand the symbolism in the Old Testament. The symbolism and the type. Imagine if we were in the Old Testament and this were the tabernacle. This room is far larger than the Holy of Holies was, but imagine that we were in the Holy of Holies, in the very presence of God. Now, in the Old Testament, we would not have been permitted here. The priest, once per year, was permitted to come into the Holy of Holies to present the blood of the sacrifice, and then very quickly go back out into the holy place, and then out into the courtyard where the altar was and the laver. But imagine that we are in the most holy place, and that, that narthex back there where you come in is the holy place, and then under the canopy where the cars drive up is the entrance. There would be the altar of burnt offering, standing as a barrier, as it were, to entrance into the fellowship with God. You can't get, pa you can't get into 
the dwelling of God unless you go past that altar. And you see that a sacrifice has been made. That's what was going on in the Old Testament. So when Nadab and Abihu sinned, you understand that the explanation of many commentators about this history is not right. There are some commentators who say that the sin of Nadab and Abihu was that they were not authorized to do this. They were offering incense, but they shouldn't have been offering incense. But that can't be the case because we've seen already that they were duly ordained priests. There are others who say that the sin was that they offered the incense at the wrong time, the wrong time of the day. Now that's a possibility. That is hypothetically, not according to the text, but hypothetically. God did prescribe a time of the day in the morning, and in the evening, and it's possible that this sacrifice was offered some other time of the day. But that's not what the text says. And there are others who say that the sin of Nadab and Abihu is that they mingled the wrong ingredients to make up this incense. If you read in the book of Leviticus, there was a very specific instruction as to what gummy substances or powdery substances needed to make up this incense. And if you had the wrong substances. It was strange incense. That's the language used in the Bible. Strange incense. But the Word of God does not call this strange incense. It plainly says they offered strange fire. Strange fire. Unauthorized or foreign fire because it did not come from the altar of burnt offering. It came from some other fire. And because of that, the judgment of God was swift and severe. They died. Nadab and Abihu were killed. By the capital punishment of God Himself, these men perished. Fire came out from the Lord, the very same fire that had come out moments earlier to consume the offering now came out from the Lord and consumed them, destroyed them, and executed them. That's astounding. You read at the end of chapter 9 that when the people saw that fire come out from the Lord and burn the sacrifice, they shouted. You can imagine the gasp that came up. The shock that they had when they saw that fire unexpected consuming that sacrifice. Now that same fire in a public de demonstration of God's honor, glory, and holiness comes out and destroys Nadab and Abihu. It didn't incinerate them because their bodies were carried out, to the ta out from the tabernacle by their cousins, but it caused them to die instantly. That's severe punishment. It's because of this kind of punishment that some people reject the Old Testament. There are those who read the Bible and read history like this and come to the conclusion that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. They reject the God of the Old Testament and accept the God of the New Testament, ignoring conveniently that in the book of Acts, God did something very similar to this to Ananias and Sapphira. But aside from that, they say the God of the New Testament is our God, but not the God of the Old Testament. That's an old heresy that came up early in the history of the church. What kind of God is this, they say, in the Old Testament who would do such a thing to people? Or, there are those more honest, I suppose, than they, who reject God altogether and say that that God that the Bible describes is not our God because they've made a God of their own imagination. And gradually rejecting the Bible piecemeal, pretty soon come up with no Bible at all, because they have in their imagination what kind of God they want to worship, and they see the, Bi the, the Bible's God and say, He's not our God. But you understand, people of God, this is the God of the Scripture. No different today than He was 4,000 years ago, whose judgment today 
is the very same as the judgments then. And although the form and the sub, uh, although the outward ceremonies, the outward display of that fire coming out from God doesn't take place today, the language of the Belgic Confession is very important for us. The truth and the substance of all of this remains in the New Testament for us. This is the God of the Scriptures. This is our God who executed these men. Why? Why? What law did they violate? What truth about God did they deny? Why such severe punishment for these two oldest sons of Aaron? There are really two answers to this question, why, and explanation as to the reason. The second answer will explain the reason for the sermon's title tonight, but the first answer is important too. God judged them in the first place because they violated the clear second commandment of God's law. The second commandment of God's law says, Worship me only as I have commanded. I find that young people and children often confuse the first and the second commandment and don't know the difference between idols. That's what the first commandment forbids. And images which the second commandment forbids. The first commandment says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's idolatry, worshiping another god. The second commandment, after we've established who we must worship, the second commandment says, Do not worship that one true God in the wrong way. And in the Old Testament, that wrong way was primarily by images. Don't carve, don't mold, don't draw, don't paint anything to represent God and worship God in that way. Worship God spiritually. Or if you would be very practical and go into the Old Testament and ask that question, how should we worship God? The answer would be easy. Read the book of Leviticus. Read the book of Deuteronomy. This is how God wills to be worshipped. The second commandment doesn't say, make sure you don't worship in any way that God forbids. Of course that's true. But the second commandment says, make sure you don't worship God in any way that He does not command. Read the commandments of God. In the Old Testament, it's Leviticus and Deuteronomy especially. In the New Testament, it's the New Testament. Read the prescriptions of the New Testament. That's how God wants us to worship Him. And it's striking that that's exactly the point of the text, isn't it? The text does not say they offered strange fire which God had forbidden... The text says they offered strange fire which God had not commanded. It's not even they offered strange fire that God commanded them not to offer, but they offered strange fire that God had not commanded. They did something that was not revealed in the Scripture. God will that we today learn that He is to be worshipped only as He's commanded in the Scripture. Nadab and Abihu ignored this. They invented how they thought God should be worshipped, and for that, God judged them with death. We mustn't underestimate the importance of that explanation of this text for us today. To use the language of the New Testament in the book of Colossians, Nadab and Abihu were guilty of will worship. Colossians 3, will worship. That is, worshiping God in the way that we will to worship instead of the way God wills to be worshipped. And remember, that's the regulative principle of worship that 
not only says don't do what God forbids, but don't do what God does not command. And there's a difference. Let me make that difference plain. I don't suppose that any of our churches have worship committees like some churches do today. Perhaps you have a a worship committee of, of a couple of elders who supervise what's offered in programs and perhaps approve songs that are sung in uh, pre-service singspiration, but we don't have the kind of worship committee that many churches have. But in those worship committees, often weekly, maybe monthly or annually, they sit down and ask the question, what would make our worship more meaningful? What would we like to do that will make our worship more significant? What would you like us to do? What, you would, you'd, what would you like us to do in worship? And that question is forbidden. Because it isn't what I want to do and what I think would make this worship more meaningful. The question is, what does the Word of God reveal to us as to the content of our worship? It doesn't say... Worship God with banners and pomp and dancing. It doesn't say reenact those Old Testament festivals and feasts, which many of the churches are doing today. They're reenacting the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and so forth. They're burning incense again and wearing vestments again. And they're performing skits and dramas and dialogues. And they're all asking what would make the worship more significant for us. Instead of asking what does the Word of God call us to do. And remember in that connection it's not the appearance of right. It's not their intentions and motivations that that are important. Because if you would have looked and asked the people of God in the time of Nadab and Abihu. What did you think of it? they probably would have said, I don't understand this. They were duly ordained priests. They had all the right vestments on. They had the proper utensils, the censers. They took the incense that was properly mixed and they went in a very formal, careful, reverent way into the tabernacle and God executed them. Those young men, perhaps the response of some would have been, were well-intentioned. And I didn't see anything that was wrong. And so the important point for us to make is, it's not what appears to us on the basis of our judgment to be right, or what even is in the heart and the intention of the people who do these strange things. It is what they do. What they do. And then we need to apply that very carefully to ourselves and ask ourselves what we do. And be sure in our own minds and in our consistories and in our congregations that what we do on a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening comes by prescription of God in the New Testament. That's the first explanation as to why God judged Nadab and Abihu. That's a legitimate explanation of why God judged them. But it's not the main one. It's not the most important one. The main reason that God judged Nadab and Abihu is that Nadab and Abihu rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. These two oldest sons of Aaron rejected the type that pointed them to the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, we will approach God in some other way than through the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fire by which their incense was burned... And now think very carefully, the fire that fired their prayers to God was not the fire that consumed the substitutionary sacrifice. The way they thought they could have into the presence of God was not the way of that burnt offering where an innocent substitute was provided for them, judged instead of them. 
but they came with their own fire and their own prayers, and they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They supposed they could come in the presence of God and make prayers and ask for God's blessing. Not in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now put yourself in that Old Testament situation again. We're in the holy place, the most holy place. There out there represents the holy place where the altar of incense was. And outside beyond that is the altar of burnt offering, the fire from God, the judging wrath of God has just flashed out from the tabernacle, burnt that sacrifice. That's the fire that must be taken now to fire their incense. And Nadab and Abihu take their own fire, their own, and burn their incense to God by that representing their own works and their own worth and rejecting the offering that pointed to Christ. Now, children, you understand why the title of the sermon is what it is. Children, when you were taught to pray by your parents from your earliest youth, you ended your prayer, probably all of you, with these words, For Jesus' sake, Amen. You must never pray without those words. And now after tonight's sermon, you must never pray without thinking about those words. When you pray tonight before you go to bed, children, you pray God to forgive your sins. You ask God to bless you. You ask God to give you comfort and hope. You ask God to give you strength to serve Him. You ask God to assure you that what's happening to you is not wrong, but according to His will. God, come to us and bless us, please. And then you end that prayer and all those requests with these words. For Jesus' sake, bless us. Don't bless me, God, because I've been good. Don't forgive my sins because I haven't disobeyed my parents so much today. That's not what you pray. But you ask all of these things from God for the sake of the one sacrifice of the Lord Jesus the Christ. That's, that exposes some of us in our prayers sometimes too, doesn't it? We mistakenly end our prayers sometimes saying, In thy name we pray, or for thy sake. And we're addressing Jehovah God, the triune God. God wants us to pray in the name of His Son and for the sake of His Son and always say and think for Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. When we send missionaries on the mission field, we need to tell the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims, you can't come to God. You won't go to heaven unless you come to God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no access for you into that holy of holies in heaven. There's no paradise for you in the end after this life is finished unless you come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims may be good people outwardly. You may be kind and generous and thoughtful. You may be upright according to the laws of your land. You may be useful for the population where you live. You may be the most upright people anyone has ever seen, but you do not have access to God and heaven unless you come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We tell them the very same thing we tell our children. Either you depend on that sacrifice that gives you access here and find shelter from the wrath of God that comes from heaven under the shadow of the cross, or the wrath of God will come on you and destroy you everlastingly. We tell the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Muslims, the Hindus and the Buddhists that don't confess anything about Jesus, the Muslims who say we like Jesus as a prophet too, but Muhammad is greater, and we don't depend on any sacrifice that that man made. We say you can't. 
with that confession, come into the presence of God. He doesn't approve you. He's angry with you, and in the end, He will judge you. Do you see why if we deny this history and say that this is an Old Testament God with no application today, that we deny the, the fundamentals of the Christian faith? There isn't Christianity anymore. It's just some kind of morality that people want. We worship this God. This God. There's a man down the street five or ten miles that denies that there is a hell. Doesn't like the Reformed faith and preaches to multitudes of people who have left Reformed churches. Who has denied this revelation of God in the Old Testament. That's not my God, he says. God wouldn't do that. There is no hell. Not that kind of hell in any case. We must tell him, if he would listen, and all of the people who listen to him, there is a hell. It's revealed here in Leviticus chapter 10. It's the fire of the wrath of God that destroys everyone that doesn't find shelter in the cross of Christ. Last Sunday evening we were driving to visit after church, and I heard an interview on National Public Radio with the president of the largest seminary in the world. That man reads the standard bearer. He's written letters to the editor recently. I won't name his name. In that interview that NPR had with him, he mockingly, although very carefully and cordially, mocked the church of his youth, saying something like this, when I was young, the Pope was Antichrist. The enemy of the true church was the Pope. And then reading between the lines, obviously his intention was to say, but we've learned better than that. In the 60s and the 70s he said the church's enemy was communism. Communism. That was the great Antichrist. But we've grown to see that that wasn't true either. And then in the 80s and 90s, he said, we have come to believe that the great enemy of the church is Islam, the Muslims. And here's where he was going. They are not our enemies either. They are our friends. They worship the same God that we do. And they love that same God that we do and are approved by that same God as we are approved. He's wrong sadly influencing hundreds of seminarians and future preachers in the world. He's wrong. The Word of God says a Muslim who does not confess Jesus Christ perishes everlastingly. But come back to us. You are in this holy place. In the Old Testament, only one priest once per year could come into this holy place. Now all of you are priests. You're here. What right do you have to be here? Standing in the presence of God Himself. The minister isn't God. He speaks on behalf of God. You are standing in the presence of God Himself. What right do you have to be here? You are here for Jesus' sake. And only for Jesus' sake. And if you and I ever try to enter into the presence of God without consciously thinking of the blood and the sacrifice of Christ and the wrath of God that came upon Him instead of me, then I am here improperly. And I must be very, very careful because that's the only way I may come into the presence of God. It's worth saying by way of parenthesis before I go to the last point that 
verses 8 through 11 in this chapter, belong there. Though they seem to be inserted there without explanation, they belong there, and likely they belong there because Nadab and Abihu were under the influence. In those verses, God commanded Aaron, drink not wine, nor drink strong, nor strong drink when you go into the tabernacle. You mayn't drink liquor when you are engaged in the service of the tabernacle. And most of the commentaries, I judge rightly, assume that part of the sin of Nadab and Abihu was that they were under the influence of alcohol. At least their inhibitions were loosened. And they dared do what they otherwise would not have dared do. At least publicly, taking incense, taking coals from some other place. And so a warning is given in these verses. You may not serve God under the influence of wine or strong drink. The applications of that are probably many. One of them is that we are permitted to drink wine or strong drink in moderation. Not in the tabernacle, God said to them. Obviously, it meant they were permitted elsewhere. Not in the exercise of the official duties. Obviously, elsewhere they could have, were permitted to, in moderation. But the more important application of this is that offices, office bearers can destroy their place in their office by misuse of alcohol. And we who are in those positions need to be very, very careful. Drunkenness is one of the sins, repeated drunkenness, that the church order gives as a sin that makes a man worthy of deposition. But that aside now, the response. The response of the people of God to this sin and God's judgment of that sin is twofold. First, it is humble acceptance of the judgments of God. Humble acceptance of the judgments of God. And then believing reliance on the one sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. But first, humble acceptance of the judgments of God. You mustn't argue with God's judgment. You must not criticize God's execution of these men. You must not complain about the severity of it. You must do as Aaron did and hold your peace. You must do as Moses did and say, this is it that God spoke about when He said, I will be sanctified. That is, I will be set apart among the people that worship me. I will be held up and revered and esteemed as the holy God. I will be. And I will be by my judgments upon those who try to have fellowship with me in any other way than I have commanded in my word. Especially in any other way than by Jesus Christ. Humble acceptance of the judgments of God. There is a hell. We mustn't argue about that. We mustn't deny that. God will judge men now, and God will judge men in the future in hell too. But that's not the most important part of this humble acceptance of the judgment of God. It was Aaron who held his peace. And I can't think of a burden greater for a man than the burden that Aaron bore at that time. His two oldest sons. His own sons executed publicly under the wrath and judgment of God because they rejected the way into the presence of God and tried to make their own way. And God destroyed his sons. And Moses said to Aaron, Be quiet. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses said to Aaron and to Aaron's remaining sons, Stay there in your clothing. Be careful that you don't mourn now the loss of your sons. Let the rest of Israel mourn them. 
You are in office. Your work is to finish the work of the tabernacle and show the people what access to God is all about. You've been anointed. You have labors to perform. Finish those labors. And I can't imagine the burden in the heart of that man. I think that explains the question that everyone asks about the end of the chapter. How do you explain that that meat wasn't eaten? And Moses accepted the explanation of Aaron. Aaron's comments were to the effect that God would not have accepted me had I eaten with that attitude having lost my own sons. But aside from that, the end of the chapter, Aaron was taught, a humble acceptance of the judgments of God. Aaron had to learn to take God's side and not his children's side. And we need to learn that too. Unbelievably difficult as that is for anyone. We don't defend our children. We don't stand for them when they're standing against God. We don't cover them improperly. And criticize then the church or the church's office bearers or God Himself. We take the Lord's side. God is God and He will be sanctified among the people. Humble submission to the judgments of God. And second, believing reliance on the only sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to God. Come into the presence of God. Fellowship with God. Ask Him whatsoever you will according to the Word of God. Ask Him to open the storehouses of heaven to bless you. Ask Him to testify that He loves you. Ask Him to take away all of your sin and shame and guilt. Ask Him. Ask Him. Come to Him. Do that but only for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come at the beginning of your prayers with that consciousness. I'm praying and asking these things for Jesus' sake. And then end your prayers with that phrase, for Jesus' sake. But come, come. That's the command of the Word of God. Don't suppose that anything will allow you access except the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't think that anything will keep you away from access to God because you stand in the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't suppose that your standing in the church will give you access, do you? The fact that someone laid his hands on you and put you in office or installed you as an elder or a deacon, that doesn't give you access to God. The fact that you're educated or wealthy or popular, or fun to be with. That doesn't give you access to God. The fact that you dress well, and have nice toys, and people respect you, that doesn't give you access to God. And the fact that you are lowly, and feel dirty, and unworthy, may not keep you away. Because you don't come because of your own worth. You don't come because you've done anything to deserve the love and the favor of God. The way is open to filthy sinners, to us, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we preach. That's what we teach our seminary students to preach. The cross is the center of the church's worship, the cross, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God revealed to us in that cross is the heart of it all. So tonight, children, when you pray, you think of those last words. Don't rattle them off, for Jesus' sake, but say them very carefully, and think about it, and talk about that with your parents. And then next Sunday morning, when you drive into church, and you come into this sanctuary, this place of fellowship with God, you take every step if you remember and think about why you are permitted to come into the presence of God for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
We give Thee thanks for forgiving us in Jesus. We give Thee thanks for His substitute, His substitutionary sacrifice for the offering of Himself for us as an evidence of Thy love to us. We thank Thee for the privilege to come into the house of prayer. We thank Thee for the privilege to offer up our prayers and for receiving those prayers as a sweet-smelling incense. We thank Thee, Father, for blessing us. And we pray now as we leave tonight, continue to speak a good word upon us. Prosper our way. Guide our feet. And forgive our sins. And make us holy. And we pray this all in the name of Thy Son and for the sake of Jesus. Amen. Two hundred six. Let's sing two hundred six. This is the only versification of Psalm seventy five in the Psalter. I didn't check the Corral section, but a very important psalm that speaks of the righteous judgments of God. Notice especially the fourth stanza, Jehovah holds a cup of wrath and holds it not in vain. For all the wicked of the earth, its bitter dregs shall drain. The New Testament church, you and I, sing this confession. Let's sing the five stanzas. Sing with understanding number 206.
Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.